reminder, we have a homework quiz this Thursday. And then of course you have, and I'll be putting one more problem. It's an easy problem. I'll be adding one more problem to the assignment, bringing it up to four problems total. Uh, that's this Thursday. I'll of course have my office hours tomorrow, week, late afternoon and evening. Madison will have her office hours on Thursday. And then of course you're, as you all chose, you're gonna have your midterm exam on Tuesday of next week. Is this yeah. Oh, no, 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 no homeworks. No homework over spring break and no homework on the Thursday before spring break. Yeah, don't worry about that. I wouldn't do that to you. Other questions? Comments? Snyder marks? No? Awesome. Let's get going. So, we have gone, we have waded our way through some pretty sophisticated mathematics. And we've developed quite a few ideas. We've developed manifolds, tensors, covariants, derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. Now it is time to put it all together and show you the general theory of relativity. And you'll understand, hopefully, that all of those ingredients were necessary for even stating the theory. So we have two questions that we have to answer. A, how does space-time get curved. And then B, how does this curvature influence the motion of things? Now, as I, as I pointed out to you earlier, we're doing a split in this class, which is often done in physics context. It doesn't have to be done, but we're doing it. And it's pretty much largely the way that a lot of general relativity calculations are done. And that is we're doing a background test particle split. That is, we're going to talk about how you create the geometry in terms of large sources and then once we have that geometry, we're going to take it to be fixed, and then we're going to look at the motion of a small object in that geometry, where what we're going to ignore is the fact that any object curves space-time. So the small object could curve space-time locally, but its effects are going to be minimal compared to the large background. Okay? We don't have to do this, but this is done in most of physics. It's done in electromagnetism, for example, where you take you know, a capacitor, creates a big-ass electric field, and you stick a little electron in there, and you let the little electron go, and you ignore the fact that the little electron is creating its own electric field. Okay? Same sort of distinction. So, the answer to the first question, how does space-time get curved? How do sources create curvature, and then the second question, okay, we've got a curved background, how does that influence the motion of things? So in answer to A, we have what are called Einstein's equations. Okay? And Einstein's equations are these. And I put the S in its parentheses because Technically, it's one equation, but technically, it's 10 equations. You know how that goes. So here's Einstein's equation. OK? The Einstein equation is built out of the, what's this? Say again? Is it the Riemann tensor? The Riemann tensor is that four index object. This is contracting a couple of the indices to make it a two index object, which has the name? Ritchie. Ritchie. This is the Ritchie tensor. This is the Ritchie scalar. This is the energy momentum tensor. Okay? So 
This thing on the left is often called the Einstein tensor G mu nu, capital G mu nu, okay? I won't often refer to it as such, but that's just common in the literature. It just reduces Einstein's equation a little bit to G mu nu equals eight pi G T mu nu, okay? One of the important things to observe is that the Einstein tensor G mu nu is symmetric under the exchange of these two indices. Because remember, the Riemann tensor contracted over two indices to give us the Ricci tensor results in this two index object, and if I swap the indices, I get the same thing. Of course, this is the metric, and if I swap the indices on the metric, I get the same thing. And this is the energy momentum tensor. And of course, on this guy, if I swap the indices, I get the same thing, which is necessary for the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side. I couldn't have a symmetric exchange be equal to an anti-symmetric exchange. That wouldn't even make sense, okay? Now, why am I making that observation? Anybody? How many equations is this? Yes? No, 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 no. So how big are these if you represent them as matrices? They're four by four, so they have how many elements? Sixteen. Sixteen. But if they must be representable by a symmetric matrix, how many independent elements do they have? Ten. Ten. Does everybody understand how you count that? You just, you know, if I have a two by two matrix, and it's symmetric, I only have three independent elements. I get the diagonal and I get one of the off-diagonals because this one's the same. So now just bump that counting up to four by four matrices and you'll find out that there's 10. So this is 10 independent equations. Hence the S in Einstein's equations, <laughs> okay? Now, all energy sources are contained in the energy momentum tensor. Remember, this includes mass, it includes energy, it includes momentum, it includes E and M fields, etc. Okay? So the energy momentum tensor contains every single thing that has some energy associated with it, all right? And then the left-hand side is built purely out of the geometry, okay? Because the Ricci tensor is built from the Riemann tensor, which is built from the Christoffel symbols and the inverse metric. So basically, the R mu nu and the R can be built entirely in terms of the metric. The metric, of course, is the metric. So this side contains metric unknowns, and then this side contains all the source terms, okay? So what we do is we solve this for G mu nu, which, of course, can in principle be a function of where you are, okay? So given a set of sources, this side is a differential equation for the unknown metric, which again has 10 independent components. Now you could turn this around and say, well, wait a minute, suppose that I gave you the geometry, suppose that I gave you the metric, What could you determine if given the metric? Let me pull a card. Matthew. Matthew, if I gave you the metric, what could you use this equation to figure out? Say again? The ds squared? Yeah. No, 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 use this equation to figure out. Oh, okay. If I gave you the metric, what could you determine? The energy momentum tensor. 
These you can construct from the metric. So what I'm saying is if I gave you the metric, you could just calculate the left-hand side. You don't have to solve it. It's just a given. And that would give you t mu nu. Okay? You're going to get to do that in homework. That's the easy part. Yes? What is g, capital G? G is just a constant. It's the gravitational constant. Yeah, so it is a non-dynamical thing. It's just ultimately the coupling. Okay? We have to have a coupling in there somewhere. We have to talk about how strong gravity is, and this g is the measure of it. Okay? So if I ever gave you a metric, which I will, and ask you to calculate t, that's actually straightforward. Because this is a differential equation, but you just put the function in and act on it. That's not normally the way we use this. Normally the way we use this is we're given t, find g. So it's a bit of a headache. Okay? We'll find a different way to write it in a bit, which can simplify things in certain cases. Now, here's an interesting observation. We have 10 equations and 10 unknowns. Because remember, this is 10 equations, and the thing we're trying to solve for, this is if we're given t mu nu, the thing we're trying to solve for has 10 unknowns. 10 equations, 10 unknowns. Sound pretty good, right? I wish this story was that simple. It never is. But it was back in like algebra in, in, in elementary school. And you took your algebra, your advanced algebra course in elementary school, you remember that? You guys don't remember advanced algebra from elementary school. Neither do I. Okay, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> I wish it was this easy, but unfortunately it's not. Okay, turns out that the Riemann curvature tensor satisfies yet another equation. which is often called the Bianchi identity. And the Bianchi identity says that del upper mu acting on the Ricci tensor is one half del lower rho acting on the Ricci scalar. So, now, this is a set of differential equations as well, right? Everybody agree? It's got the delta. Okay. So this actually adds four more dippy cues. Now, if I have six or if I have 14 equations and 10 unknowns, what kind of situation am I in? Is it overdetermined? Yeah, it could be overdetermined. There might not be a solution. That's the way we normally do counting. Okay? But it turns out that's not the way that this impacts the story. This impacts the story by actually removing four of these equations. Now let me give you a really simple example of this. Suppose that I had three differential equations, no functions of x, y, and z. So I have equation one, equation two, and equation three. Okay? That looks good. There's three equations, three unknowns, everything's really pretty. Okay? Seems like you can solve these for the unknowns. But suppose I added a fourth equation. But suppose that the fourth equation was just that E1 plus E2 plus E3 equals zero. So while you might look at this and say, it's, oh man, it's overdetermined, 
It's actually underdetermined. Because what the fourth equation is basically telling you is that these three are not independent. Okay? If you know E1 and E2, you automatically know E3. Okay? Now, I'm going to have some more to say about that in a moment and its impact on this story, which will actually make sense when I lay it out to you. But before I do that, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and reflect on an example of this which you should be more familiar with. And that is the case for electromagnetism. So let's consider electromagnetism for a moment, where we have del dot E equals rho, del cross B equals J plus partial E, partial T. Okay? Now, how many equations does this represent? Skylar. Yeah. Skylar. How many equations? Four. Four, right. This is four equations for Skylar. How many unknowns? Say you're given the sources, rho and J. How many unknowns? Six, yeah, for six unknowns. Okay? These four equations are the dynamical content of electromagnetism. That is, these four equations can be derived from the Lagrangian using Lagrange mechanics. Okay? However, there is another four equations which plays an important role. And these are, of course, del cross E equals minus B or minus DBT and del dot B equals zero. These four equations are geometric. Okay? So these four equations are actually often called the Bianchi identity associated with electromagnetism. They are a statement about the geometry which does not include the sources at all. Notice there's no sources in these terms. Okay? Now, okay, so this story reduces to eight total equations for six unknowns. Okay. Which once again might sound bad. Okay. However, notice that these two equations lend to us the idea that we can actually write the electric field as the gradient of a scalar, and then the magnetic field as the curl of a vector potential. And in terms of these potentials, it ends up being four unknowns, which we can then use these equations to solve for, and now we have a perfect match, right? Because if I treat phi and A as my four unknowns, this is a scalar, this is a vector, so four components. I have four equations from here, perfect match. I use these equations to do this, to justify this, okay? So now I have four equations, four unknowns, looks like a nice story, right? Except, well, there's always an exception, okay? However, you should be very familiar with this exception. Let me go through this. First of all, I can take these equations and I can actually combine them. So if I do del dot this equation, I end up with del dot del cross B equals del dot J plus D by DT of del dot E, okay? Now, of course, I've got from this equation what del dot E is, 
So I can write this as del dot j uh, plus d rho dt. All right. And then we have what is called the charge current continuity condition. And the charge current continuity condition just says that del dot j plus partial rho partial p <sighs> equals zero. Okay? This is just a statement about charge conservation. Now in the end, this is going to give us the following relation, minus partial rho, partial p, plus partial del dot e. Oh, no, 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 hold on, no, no, no. I don't want to do this yet. Hang on. No, I won't do this. I'm just going to take this, and I'm going to insert it into that equation. And then it will give me partial del dot e with respect to t equals zero, okay? Or partial t del dot e minus rho equals zero, okay? Now, the partial derivative of this is zero. If we start out by satisfying this equation, then we are guaranteed that it will not become dissatisfied by any solution. This is what you would call a non-dynamical constraint. Okay? There's no time dependence in this expression as long as it starts out at zero. Okay? Now what this means is that as long as you're starting with this as a sort of initial condition, then you're guaranteed that this equation is satisfied, which means you only have effectively three dynamical equations you can use to solve for these four unknowns. This means it's what? Underdetermined. Should it be underdetermined? Who says yes? Who says no? You guys are not the strongest voters. Who says yes? Who says no? Joel, are you going to vote? Yes or no? Yes. Yes? Sure. I'll leave it her with the question. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks it should be underdetermined? Who says yes? Gage. Gage. Yes. What did I say? Gage. Okay, folks. If I gave you phi and A, can you transform those solutions? And still have a solution? Yes, you can. What kind of transformation? A gauge transformation. A gauge transformation. Do you want me to shut up? That's fine. So remember, phi goes to phi plus the partial derivative with respect to time of some scalar, and a goes to a plus del lambda. If a and phi satisfy the equations, then so will too these gauge transformed a and phi. So you have a single parameter that you can use to deform these solutions which makes sense. Now it makes sense that you have four unknowns, you only have three dynamical equations that they have to satisfy, and so therefore there should be at least one degree of freedom you can tweak that will carry answers into answers into answers, and that's this gauge transformation, or these gauge transformations. They're all dictated by the single parameter lambda. Now I say that because it should be something with which you're somewhat familiar. You've seen gauge transformations in electromagnetism, I hope to God. 
because electromagnetism is a theory which is completely built out of a gauge transformation. But anyway, we won't go there. Let's come back to general relativity. In general relativity, we had 10 equations that we could solve for a 10 component object. Sounded like a perfect match. But then there was this damned geometric equation, the Bianchi identity. And instead of adding four equations, which would make it overdetermined, it actually removed four equations, which makes it underdetermined. So if you solve for the metric, you can deform your answer in four ways. Because this is only six equations that you're using to try and solve for a 10 component object. Now let me ask you a question. Hannah! Hannah? Hi. Hannah. Yes? If I solved for the metric, and then I want to argue I can change it in four ways, what do you think the four ways I can change the metric correspond to? Uh, what do we have four of? We have four unknown. Uh, four vector components. Well, the, but the fact that we have four vector components is based on the fact that our space is four dimensions. We have four coordinates. Think about it. If we solve and find the metric in a particular coordinate system, we can always change the coordinates, and that will change the form of the metric. How many coordinates do we have to deform? Four. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that there is a gauge symmetry in general relativity. It's called coordinate transformation. Okay, so here's the important final story to Einstein's equation. You want to solve Einstein's equation for g mu nu. And then all g mu prime nu prime which are gotten from the solution g mu nu by coordinate transformations, describe the same geometry. So the geometry is not crisply defined by the metric, but rather this family of metrics. Okay, in the same way that this metric This metric describes the same space, just in different coordinates. Okay? Does this make sense? As promised, I'm trying to make as tight an analogy to electromagnetism as humanly possible, because that's the subject with which you've probably seen at least this structure. Okay? Any questions before we press on? All right, so this is the answer to A. How does space-time get curved? It's the answer to A, but it's also the task in A, because normally you're given the energy momentum tensor, and then you have to solve this, differential, this set of differential equations to find the metric components, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. When solving, oh, yeah, go ahead, go. So normally, in a, in a general relativity solution, we'll take an R equals infinity. So, we, if, so if we're working with a spherical, which is a, obviously a solution which is important for astrophysical you know, count, we'll just take the, the uh, R equals infinity to be flat space. 
Um, so the, you, we're basically going to get asymptotic geometries, and we're going to focus on a local perturbation of the geometry. In a cosmological context, things are going to be a bit different. Okay, so <clears throat> all right. So now, oh yeah, yeah. What I was going to say before Joel interrupted me <laughs> is that. When we're solving this, and we will solve this exactly once, I'll give you many solutions, but I'm only going to solve it once because it's a pretty pain to solve. Um, but when you're solving it, notice you can always do coordinate redefinitions when you solve it because you know the theory is invariant under coordinate redefinitions. Okay, and so that will be a tool that we'll employ significantly when we're actually looking for a solution of this. All right, so now we're going to move on to B, which is how do we describe how the geometry impacts things. I don't know why I just erased the answer to A, but I will. I'll write it up again later. Okay, so in answer to B, what we can use is something that's called the minimal coupling principle. Okay, so for the minimal coupling procedure, which is something which I've hinted at before, okay, and this, this actually ties back to the Einstein equivalence principle. We go through basically three steps. Start with a law valid in an inertial frame in flat space. Or space time. Okay? Write the law in terms of tensors. And then we take that huge step. that the law also holds in curved space time. Okay? Now remember, part of the basis for doing this is the Einstein equivalence principle, which says it doesn't matter how curved your space is, if you go to a small enough neighborhood, i.e. you do an experiment in a small enough lab over a small enough time interval, results are going to look exactly the same as in flat space. Okay? And if the law or the rule that you're writing down is written in terms of tensors, I can change coordinates away from those local inertial coordinates and the law should still be true. Okay? So in practice, what we're going to do is we're going to say, one, start with a Lorentz invariant theory in terms of tensors. And then two, we replace the metric that is relevant for special relativity with the metric of a curved space. And we replace the simple partial derivative, which is the derivative we would use in the case of special relativity and Cartesian coordinates, and we replace it with the covariant derivative everywhere. Okay?
So again, this is basically the, the specific items or the specific uh, steps to implement these things. But we're basically starting in flat space with a Lorentz invariant theory written in terms of tensors. Okay? And then we're letting this thing migrate away from flat space. So we're letting the metric from a flat space go into the metric of a curved space. And then, of course, the derivative also has to change. Okay? So let's look at some examples of applying this. So let's start with EMM. In flat space time, EMM is composed of the following expressions d mu f mu nu equals j nu. It also contains the anti symmetric combination of the derivative index mu with the indices of the lowered electromagnetic field spin tensor. Uh, where, of course, F nu lambda is equal to eta nu alpha, eta lambda beta, F alpha beta. Okay? So this is Maxwell's equation. In flat space time. You should have beaten these up a little bit in a much earlier assignment. Now all I want to do is take this to curved space. Following these rules. Okay? So we now have del mu, f mu equals, oops, j nu. Del mu f nu lambda equals zero, where f nu lambda is now g nu alpha, g lambda beta, f alpha beta. Okay. This is the Kirby form of Maxwell's equation. Now, I, I want you to notice this discussion is not telling you anything about how you find the metric. Okay? The metric is the solution to Einstein's equation. Okay? But once you have the metric, this is telling you how that curved geometry influences other things through this transformation of their basic equation. Okay? Let's look at another example. Let's think about gravity for a minute. If I'm doing gravity, I can start by saying, only under gravity. So I'm going to ignore all the other forces for a moment. If I'm only talking about the influence of gravity in a flat space time, how does a particle behave? The only thing I'm thinking about is the impact of gravity. So I'm, I'm just ignoring electromagnetism, weak nuclear interactions, strongly. Gravity is the only force I'm worried about, but I'm in flat space time. What is gravity doing? It's too fast, too small. Actually, how much gravity is there in flat space time? None. So what does a particle do? Which is? Constant velocity. It's moving with a constant velocity. It can be at rest, that's a constant velocity of zero. But it can be in motion, but it can't be accelerating. There's no force acting on it. Okay? 
So only under gravity in flat space time, we have that the motion of a particle can be written like that. Okay? That is, it's a straight line path in space time. A straight line path in space time is constant velocity motion. Okay? Think about it for a moment. That's probably not the best, because that's faster than the speed of light. Okay? A straight line in space time is constant velocity motion. Delta x over delta t would be constant. Okay? So here's the equation of a line. Of course, we could also write this as d2 x mu d lambda squared equals zero. Second derivative of a line is obviously zero. Or better still, we can write this as dx nu d lambda partial nu dx mu d lambda equals zero. Okay? And this is just using the directional derivative equivalent. Now the reason I did that is because when I want to apply these replacements, what needs to be replaced? Yeah. As promised, and I told you this when I talked about the geodesic equation introducing the idea, the impact of gravity on the behavior of things in general relativity, the impact of a curved geometry on the behavior of things, gravity is the same as curved geometry, the impact is that a particle only experiencing the force of gravity will undergo geodesic motion. Of course, you can stop it from undergoing geodesic motion by applying other forces. I am being stopped from undergoing geodesic motion by the normal force of the ground. If I stepped off of a cliff and got in a free fall, I'd be undergoing geodesic motion. Okay? Because gravity would be the only force, skipping out on wind resistance. All right? Are we on board? Now, I, I just told you two components of the story. I, A, told you how gravity influences things, but I also told you how the curved geometry influences other forces as well. Because if you think about it, a curved geometry is going to impact everything. Okay, electromagnetism looks different in a curved geometry. The weak nuclear forces look different in a curved geometry. You would look different in a curved geometry. Okay? But to figure out what you would look like, all you have to do is write it in terms of tensors and then replace the metric everywhere it appears with the curved metric and the derivative with respect, or replace it with the covariant derivative. Okay? All right, how are we, how we doing? Doing okay? All right, you really want to solve those equations, I know. So, let's do that. 
But really and truthfully, in a very, very minimal context, that this looks incredibly fancy, but at the end of the day, what does general relativity generalize? How full of cards? Sam. What does general relativity generalize? Special relativity? No. Yeah. You're close. The Newtonian gravity? Exactly. It's a generalization of Newtonian gravity. If special relativity plays an important role in formulating general relativity, but if you ask, what is the correspondence principle between general relativity and a simpler theory? It's Newtonian gravity. Okay? Remember, general relativity is a theory. It's not a framework. It's a theory of the gravitational force. So it should correspond in a certain limit to another force, and that force is Newtonian gravity. Okay? So what we're now going to spend the rest of this lecture doing is unearthing that correspondence principle. You should be able to take all of the machinery of general relativity and by making things small or big or whatever they need to be, you should be able to tease out Newtonian mechanics in some limit. The same way if you start out with quantum mechanics and you take h bar to zero, you get classical physics. The same way if you start out with special relativity and you take c to infinity, or you take all the velocities in your problem much less than c, that will reduce to Newtonian mechanics. So now we want to take general relativity and reduce it to Newtonian gravity. Okay? Now, oh shit, I can't believe I just erased that. I'm going to write, okay, so here's its ghost. Okay? So, damn. Um, Actually, I'll just do this. I'll just remind you. The answer to question A, how does space get curved? Einstein's equation. R mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r equals 8 pi g t mu nu. And then the answer to how does the curved geometry influence things? The solution to that is the geodesic equation where now I'm just thinking about gravity by itself. So the, the result of the implementation of the minimal coupling principle, if gravity is the only thing in the story, is the geodesic equation. So we can, we can just talk about the geodesic equation or the influence of the background on the motion of things. And I'll just quickly write down the geodesic equation. In the other form, this is the same equation I wrote earlier, but it's in a slightly more useful form putting in what the covariance derivative is. Okay. In Newtonian gravity, we have two expressions which correspond to these. First of all, we have how does mass create a gravitational field, okay? Now, how you write this down is based on your, you know, your advancement in Newtonian mechanics. This is certainly beyond what we wrote down in Physics 100, but you all have taken intermediate mechanics, so hopefully this makes sense. Okay, where phi is the gravitational potential, that is g equals minus gradient of phi, where g is the gravitational field, and rho is the mass density. How many of you have seen this expression? I mean, 
mean, in your intermediate mechanics class, you should have <laughs> at some point formulated this. Now, basically, this is like the electromagnetic formulation of here's some charges or a current, find the electric and magnetic fields. Well, this is, here's some mass density. It doesn't have to be a point mass. It can be, you know, an infinite sheet of mass. Calculate the gravitational field due to that infinite sheet of mass, and you can go through the potential route. At the end of the day, this is what you might want to calculate, but you can use the potential. The equations are a little bit cleaner. Okay? But at any rate, this is telling you, given a source, this is the induced gravitational potential, which from which you can get the gravitational field, okay? And then, how do things respond? Well, they just respond that their acceleration is minus the gradient of this potential, okay? Which just uses Newton's second law with gravity and cancel masses. Okay? I mean, you know how this works. F equals ma. Well, if F is gravity, then it's G M1 or M M source over R squared, you cancel out the M's. So that's essentially the more sophisticated version of the same statement. All right. So what we would like to do is we would like to hunt for these two expressions in this framework. Okay. And I'll just warn you, it's going to get ugly. Okay. Because we're actually going to work with these equations. These equations suck. Okay. So. Back in your seatbelt. We're going to make a few assumptions because after all, this should, there should be some limit that we take. So the limits are as follows. First of all, we're going to be concerned with small velocities. So this means, of course, that dxi dt is less than c, which is, of course, just 1 this point in the course. Of course, and notice these are normal spatial velocity components, dxi dt. Okay. However, we can rewrite this as dxi d tau is much less than dt d tau, which is of course dx0 d tau. Okay. All I did was I multiplied 1 by dt, and then I did 1 over, d, 1 over d tau to both of them. And then I just identified t as the zeroth component. It's important because these are written in terms of the four components of everything, and so I want to identify that fourth component, or actually the zeroth component, x0. So anytime we see a dxi d tau, and it's added to a dx0 d tau, we can ignore this and just keep this. Okay? So these are the only terms that we really want to hang on to. These are the only ones that are appreciable in size. That's going to eliminate a hell of a lot of terms. B, we can assume a weak gravitational field. And that is we can take the curved metric and we can decompose it into the flat space metric plus a small perturbation. Okay? So we have that the magnitude of the fluctuations are much less than one. Which, of course, means that we might keep terms which are linear in this, but if you have a term which is quadratic or higher power of this, you'll just ignore it. Make sense? It's a standard description. Okay? And then last but not least, 
we're going to work in terms of a static gravitational field. That is, the derivative with respect to time of the metric will be zero. Okay? You could work with a time varying metric, but then you have to introduce these gravitomagnetic effects, which are part of the extension of the Newtonian gravitational story to a relativistic setting. Let's not do that. Let's just keep it super simple. And you know that this is, you know, this is mainly the configuration that you're dealing with when you do Newtonian gravity. Normally the source is just stationary and you change the magnet or gravitational field, which doesn't change with time. Okay, so now due to B, we are going to have to figure out what we would use for an inverse metric. So it turns out that the inverse metric. Because you can imagine we use the index metric to create these things, or sorry, the inverse metric to create things here. So in order to write, write it down, we need to think about for a moment, if I have this plus this, what is the inverse metric? Well, your idea might be, oh, it's just this. Right? You just you know, erase both of these. Unfortunately, no. It's never that simple. Okay. The inverse metric turns out to be eta mu nu minus eta mu alpha eta nu beta h alpha beta. Okay. Or you might say, wait a minute. Don't these just raise these indices? Doesn't this just raise the alpha into a mu? This raises the beta into a nu, right? Well, no, actually, if I want to raise these indices, so if I want to take H alpha beta and get an H mu nu out of it, I must use the metric. Okay. That's why I'm not writing this as a to mu nu minus h upper mu nu. All right? So it's sort of a mix, mix of play here. But at any rate, you can prove that this satisfies this critical identity, that g lambda mu g mu nu equals delta, delta lambda nu. I won't do that, but it's written up in my notes. Okay? So if I take this, and I act on g mu nu with it in this form, then you'll end up with the delta function, which is what you know defines the inverse metric with respect to the original metric. Okay, but I won't go through that because we're short on time. Okay. I know I'm going to regret having just done that. Okay, so here we go. We're going to dive right in. So first of all, I'm going to start with B. I have to basically take these equations and derive these equations by imposing these limits. That's the rule, okay? I'm going to start with B, which of course comes from here. All right, so here we go. Whew. First of all, let's take the parameter of the path in the geodesic equation. Lambda can be anything. It's just the parameter of the path through space-time. But let's take this parameter to be the proper time or the length of the path, which is what we normally do when we define, for example, four velocity. Okay, remember, four velocity is the derivative of the position vector with respect to proper time or the length of the path interval. This is not the only way you can parameterize a path. You can pick anything you want. But in order to define the four velocity, we use proper time. So we're going to use proper time here. Okay. So we know that in terms of proper time, we now have the geodesic equation of these d2x nu 
d tau squared plus gamma mu rho sigma dx rho d tau dx sigma d tau equals zero. Okay? And now I can make the following observation. This is effectively dx d2x mu d tau plus gamma zero zero mu dx zero d tau squared. Okay? Which of these three did I use to make that simplification? A, B, or C? A. A, yeah, look at this. Dx0 d tau is hella bigger than dx i d tau. This involves the sum over rho and sigma. So this is going to have all combinations. It's going to have i's and j's, i's and i's, i and 0, and 0 and 0. Every one of those terms is smaller than 0 and 0. So that's the only one we'll keep. Of course, if I have 0 here and 0 here, that means 0 here and 0 here, which is where this equation comes from. Okay. So this uses A. This is the kind of game we're going to play. What starts out with a ton of components and a super complicated expression gets a lot easier using these approximations. OK? Now, what about this Christoffel symbol, or this set of four Christoffel symbols, because it does have that index mu? Well, let's recall the definition, 1 half g mu lambda d0 g lambda 0 plus d0 g0 lambda minus d lambda g0 0. OK, this is the definition of the Christoffel symbol, except I just went ahead and put in the 0, 0 for the lower index values everywhere they appear in the expression. What can I say about these two terms? They vanish because the metric is unbent. Exactly. So these vanish. OK. This guy is equal to minus d lambda h zero, zero, by b. Because remember, we're going to take the metric, expand it into fluctuations about the flat metric, but this thing is just a bunch of constants. So the derivative of the eta part of this is 0. The h part is the only one that survives. Okay, so we got minus d lambda h zero zero. Then what we have in the geodesic equation is as follows: d two x mu d tau squared minus one half eta. Oh no, hold on. No, I'm not done yet. Hang on. Okay, so this becomes uh, minus one half g mu nu d lambda h. Zero, zero. Now we have to use the inverse metric. Okay? And then utilizing the inverse metric on this, what we're going to find is the following minus one half eta mu lambda minus eta mu alpha eta lambda beta h alpha beta d lambda h zero zero. Okay? This is just the inverse metric. However, what can you tell me about h alpha beta h zero zero? Say it again. Very small. Very small. Okay. So in this case, the inverse metric actually simplifies to that form, and now we can plug this in to get what the geodesic equation now is. It's d two x mu 
d tau squared minus one half eta mu lambda d lambda h zero zero times d t d tau squared equals zero. Okay. This is a system of four equations. One for each value of mu. All right, if we look at the mu equals zero version of this equation, this is going to be d two t d tau squared x equals x zero is just time t minus one half eta zero lambda d lambda h zero zero dt d tau squared equals zero. Okay. Now of course, what are the non-zero components of eta zero lambda? That should have four components, but how many of them are zero? Three. Three. Which one's not zero? Eta zero zero. Yeah, eta zero zero is not zero. In fact, it's minus one. So that, of course, means that we can make this zero, zero which means that this is oh, zero. Uh, D H zero. Zero. Okay. Because the metric forces us to take the lambda to be zero, which means this is the derivative with respect to time of the metric fluctuation. But remember, the metric is time independent. So at the end of the day, this whole term goes to zero. And what I'm left with is d2 t d tau squared equals zero which really is just telling us that t is proportional to tau. That is time, which is what we usually use to parameterize things when we're doing non-relativistic physics. Time is pretty much the length of the path. OK? So this means that any time we have tau, we can just replace it with time. Okay? I mean, we can do any linear function, but we'll just do t as tau. That's the sentence. So now, if we consider a spatial part, say mu equals i, then what this equation gives us now is d2 xi dt squared, because I'm basically replacing tau with t. This is the equation I'm writing, but now I'm going to take, I'm going to take mu as i, replace tau with t. So I have d2 xi dt squared minus 1 half, I'm going to make some room, 1 half eta i lambda d lambda h 0, 0 times dt, oh, dt squared equals 0. What's going to be non-zero? Lambda equals? I. Okay? So this is going to become d2 xi dt squared minus one half partial i h zero zero. Because dt dt is one. Okay? Now it turns out that in this context, Actually, no, 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 we don't want to do that. I don't want to raise the index. Okay? I don't, sorry. I, I use this to raise this index. I should not be doing that. I should not raise the index. I should just use that since this force is lambda to be i, this is also i. We cannot raise the index with the flat metric. Okay? So at the end of the day, oh my goodness, I'm in the room. Yeah, we'll just go to the top. At the end of the day, what we have is the acceleration. Everybody see that? This is just acceleration. 
the i component of the acceleration is minus partial i of minus 1 half h0, 0. zero. And all we have to do is say, OK, minus 1 h0, zero, 0 is defined as 5. And then we have a equals minus grad 5, which is exactly what we expected. Now, you might be like, oh, wait a minute. You know, you had to pick that. You know, you had this. You wanted it to be this. So therefore, you made that picking. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. However, I should use this same definition of phi in this expression as well. OK? All right, so here we go. I'm going to go a little bit quicker, because I've got to get through this. Are you ready? Now we're going to use Einstein's equation to get this expression. Once again, in the end, using this identification. Here we go. I'm going to do this quickly. And it's going to use many of the same techniques I just used. So hopefully, things won't be too much in the Here we go. Oh, shit. <laughs> Einstein's equation is so terrible. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite Einstein's equation, uh, this guy here, in what's called trace reverse form. So this means we take the, met the inverse metric on each side, OK? And if I just apply the inverse metric to each side, this is going to become the Ricci scalar. g upper mean n times g lower mean n is going to become what? Four. Four. OK? This is the trace over the metric, which is not the sum of the diagonals. OK? At any rate, don't worry too much about it. G, G, the inverse metric fully contracted with the metric. Notice this is mu nu, this is mu nu. OK? Is four. So this is minus two r. Of course, that's just minus r. And then G upper mu nu times T mu nu is the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So we have this nice relationship that r is equal to minus 8 pi g times the trace of the energy momentum tensor, which allows us to take Einstein's equation and replace this r with a term involving the energy momentum tensor. Okay. So at the end of the day, this lets us write Einstein's equation as r mu nu equals 8 pi g times t mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu times t. Okay. If you think about it, in some ways, this is a more approachable form of Einstein's equation, because this is where the unknowns are. And only having the r mu nu term versus r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r it's a bit more straightforward. Of course, the unknown still sits on this side. But it's just a factor of it. It's not a differential equation. It's not, it's not a, a, different, a, a derivative of it. OK? So this is the trace reverse form of Einstein's equation. We'll use that later in the course. But for now, I want to take as my energy momentum tensor okay, a perfect fluid in its rest frame. So that means the only contribution is the energy density. There's no momentum density. And there's no shear. OK? No pressure. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the stress, the energy momentum tensor trace. This is, of course, g mu nu t mu nu, where I have to use the inverse of the metric. So this is eta mu nu minus eta mu alpha, eta mu beta h alpha beta times t mu nu. OK? I can write this as a to 0, 0 minus a to 0 alpha, a to 0 beta, h alpha.
alpha, beta, and T0, 0, because the only non-zero component of the energy momentum tensor is the T0, 0 term. Everything else is zero. So yeah, you're summing over all of these, but the only one that's going to give you non-zero contribution is T0, 0, OK? And of course, T0, 0 equals P, or rho, right? So at the end of the day, this is just going to give us minus 1 minus H0, 0, 0 times rho. That's obvious because alpha must be what? Zero. Beta must be. So this is minus 1 times minus 1 times H0, 0. Okay? And this, of course, is minus 1 as well. All right, so now that we've got that, we can go and plug it into the trace reverse form. So this is going to give us, for the right hand side, it's going to give us 8 pi g p mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu t, and this is going to be now equal to 8 pi g times t zero zero, because again, the only non-zero component of p mu nu is the zero zero term, t zero zero minus, of course now I just have to set all the indices mu nu to zero zero, t zero zero times one minus h zero zero rho, And of course, uh, now we can, this is of course rho. We can plug in the inverse metric. And if anyone needs to go, go by all means, go ahead and go. I'll be done in just a couple of minutes, but I'm sorry for going over, but I really need to finish this. So going ahead and making the assignment, we're going to have minus one half rho plus terms order h, uh, h bar, uh, order h squared. Which is going to give me four pi g rho. I know I was quick on that, but there you go. There's the right hand side. Okay. And then to get the left hand side, all we have to do is we now have to say, all right, the left hand side is r mu nu. But all I want is the zero, zero component of this. So what I want is r zero, zero which is r0, r lambda, 0, lambda, 0. It's a summation over the Riemann curvature tensor, where you assign the same index values here that you have here. OK? And then we write down what the Riemann curvature tensor is in terms of derivatives of the Christoffel symbols and quadratic terms in the Christoffel symbols. say that this is zero because the Christoffel symbols are built from the metric. But the metric has no time dependence. Okay? And I can also say that these are zero because this involves the metric and this involves the metric. So this is quadratic in the metric. The metric is small. So we can ignore the quadratic term. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay? So we can basically set all of these to zero. So this is the only term that's going to contribute to the definition of R0, 0. This is the left hand side of the equation. So finishing this up, we have that R0, 0 is minus 1 half. And now I'm just going to go ahead and plug in exactly what gamma lambda 0, 0 is minus 1 half 
D I D I J B J G zero zero. And then plugging in what we know, this is minus one half B I D I minus one plus H zero zero, which is minus one half del squared H zero zero. And now if I replace minus one half H zero zero with phi, this is going to give me del squared phi, which is the left hand side. Okay? Now, fortunately I'm not going to ask you a damn question about this material. Not in your homework, not on an exam. This is ridiculously terse and crazy. Yet, as a lesson, I just needed to point out that general relativity is a generalization of Newtonian gravity. So the Newtonian gravity story should be somewhere in general relativity upon taking a limit. Okay? Now you've got it. With this set of limits, this general theory reduces by a correspondence principle to this simpler theory. Because this is a generalization of it. All right? That's it for today. Thanks so much for hanging out.